I could think of no more fitting song than that song. And to know the backstory of verse 3. Wow. And that's what this week is about. It's about others. It's about taking the gospel message to them. We're glad you're here tonight. The power went off at our hotel this afternoon for about two hours. And I asked Sister Norma if she lost power at her house. She said, no, I'm living right. (laughs) And then I asked Bubba if he lost power at his house. He said, yes, I did. (laughs) So you can take that for what it's worth. (laughs) It's also National Dachshund Day. Those of you who were not here yesterday morning have no idea why I would say that. (laughs) But I am still trying to dig my way out of Denise's (laughs) doghouse. And I'm crawling, groveling. (laughs) Turn in your Bibles tonight to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And verse 1. Paul says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. And then he adds this. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Some translations render that, let us perfect holiness out of reverence for God. Is that just some kind of isolated statement without any kind of application? I don't think so. So hold that thought because we're coming back. John walked to his car and he hit the button on the keypad to unlock the door and it didn't work. And he hit it again and it didn't work. Now he was able to take the key and get into the car the old-fashioned way. But when he did, the car wouldn't start. And the gas gauge read empty, although he had just filled it up that morning. In fact, nothing in the car seemed to be working correctly at all. So the vehicle had to be towed to the dealership, in which in a little while the mechanic came back and said to John, you have a bad BCM. It stands for Basic Control Module. It's it's, it's kind of the brain of your car. If the Basic Control Module doesn't work, nothing in your car is going to work. Now, John could have insisted, I want you to fix the door locks. I want you to fix the gas gauge. I want you to fix the remote control. But John was smart enough to understand that all of those were mere symptoms of a much bigger problem. I wonder, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to marriage, I wonder how often we focus on the singular symptoms instead of the basic control module. And so here is a couple and they come and they say, we need to improve on our communication one with the other. Well, okay, but that's a symptom. Another couple says, we need to get better at handling conflict, conflict resolution. Okay, but that's a symptom. Another couple says we need to show more affection. We need to show more appreciation and we need to be more romantic with one another. Well, okay, but that's a symptom. And we can spend all of our time focusing on the symptoms when we need to focus on the basic control module. And the basic control module for the Christian in marriage is a spiritual focus 
It is a spiritual motivation. It is 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. Let us perfect holiness out of reverence for God. What do you think that means? I think that means God comes first in everything and in every relationship in life. Let us perfect holiness out of reverence for God. Is marriage exempt from that or is marriage included in that? I think we know the answer. It all comes down to this. Are you going to be a God-centered spouse or are you going to be a spouse-centered spouse? A spouse-centered spouse will act nice toward her husband as long as her husband acts nice towards her. A spouse-centered spouse will go out of, way for, out of the way for his wife as long as she remains agreeable to him and affectionate to him. But does it never occur to us that God demands more from his people? Paul said we are to perfect holiness out of reverence for God. In other words, the number one motivating factor in everything we do in life, including this very special, albeit brief, earthly relationship called marriage, has to do with how much we respect God. I am not called to love my wife because she is holier than everybody else. I'm not called to love my wife because she always just makes me happy. I'm not called to love my wife because things between us every single day is always wonderfully ooey and gooey and romantic. I am called to love my wife out of reverence for God, period. Let us perfect holiness out of reverence for God. Every decision I make, every attitude I have, every behavior I manifest needs to flow from this singular holy motivation. Is this something that brings honor to God? Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, it's not about me. It's about him. Are we treating the symptoms or are we willing to work on the basic control module? There's all kinds of quotes about marriage. My favorite quote of all comes from a guy that you studied in school. His name was Socrates. Listen to this. Socrates says, by all means, get married. If you get a good wife, you'll be happy. If you get a bad wife, you'll become a philosopher. <laughs> there you go. You ever wonder why God didn't design marriage to be easier than it is? It sounds easy. If you're on the outside looking in, it looks easy. My wife went to a wedding, and uh, she came back, and I said, well, how'd it go? She said, oh, it was, it was really nice, very pretty. She said, I'm going through the receiving line, and I'm giving Lisa, the bride, I'm giving Lisa a hug, and Lisa looks at me and says, I'm so glad the hard part's over. She said, I took her, hand, her head in my hands and I said, dear one, are you in there? <laughs> How many of you ever watched a Hallmark movie? Raise your hand. Men, some of the men are raising their hands. Those are guys secure in their manhood. After we adopted the kids, Leah, Leah discovered, our teenage daughter, she discovered the Hallmark Channel. And so on Sunday afternoon when I'm wanting to watch 
football or when I'm wanting to watch some kind of sporting event to get my mind off of things so that I can crank the lazy boy into third gear and take a nap, she wants to watch the Hallmark Channel. And so, Dad, let's watch, let's watch a Hallmark movie. And I said, okay. So we would watch a Hallmark movie. But I got to tell you, spoiler alert, they are all the same. <laughs> it doesn't matter. There's this beautiful couple and they meet under improbable conditions. They fall in love. They fall out of love. They fall back in love in the, next, in the last 10 minutes. The end. And if it's a Christmas holiday Hallmark movie, which runs from July to June, they kiss at the end and it starts snowing every single time. And you watch one of those movies and it looks so easy. But it's not. And you and I know it's not easy in real time and in real life. And the reason it's not so easy is because romantic love just on the surface doesn't have any elasticity to it. You can't really start stretching romantic love because it tends to shatter. Because romantic love tends to be about me. But holy love... stretches farther than anyone ever thought it could. It has to. Because you see, when two sinful, selfish people start living together as one, there's going to be trouble. Unless each one embrace a higher motivation. What is that? Reverence for God. Does it never dawn on us that God may have a higher purpose for marriage than two people just living at the same address and sharing the same mailbox and sharing the same kitchen table and sharing the same bedroom? Does it ever dawn on us that maybe it's not your happiness he has in mind as much as it is your holiness? Now, I'm not saying happiness is over here and holiness is over here and they are mutually exclusive. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when you look at your marriage relationship through the lens of God's purpose for it, you get a whole new perspective. And what you learn is, it's not about me. So what's the real purpose of this? If you clear out all of the clutter... What's the real purpose of this? This lifelong relationship. I think the real purpose of marriage is to draw us closer to the one who brought us together. I hope you understand that your relationship with your God is going to outlast your relationship with your spouse. Your relationship with your spouse is that long. Your relationship with God is forever. And that's why just working on the symptoms won't work in the long run. Now, you can try to make your home more pleasant and peaceful. You should do that. You can look for ways to keep the romance alive. You should do that. You need to be showing courtesy and respect and kindness and compassion towards one another. You should do all of that. But if you're relationship with God is not what it ought to be. Sometimes we just put band-aids on symptoms because we forget it's all about perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Sometimes we look for sometimes we look for something in another person that ultimately and eternally, only God can provide. And I think that's why marriage dissatisfaction runs so high. Maybe it runs so high because we expect too much. Does anybody remember the old 486 computers back in the 80s? Anybody remember those? You had one? I think they had a 386, and I th my first one was a 486. The, the real floppies, remember? 
We, I was in a meeting in Centerville, Virginia, outside of Washington. My brother worked over by Capitol Hill, and so we went in one day, and we had some time to kill to wait for him to get on. Uh, we're going to go eat lunch with him. And so we went, uh, had, I think we had Luke with us, and we, and we did have Luke with us. We went over to the American History Museum in the Smithsonian, and we're looking around. And we're walking by this exhibit, and Luke says, Hey, Dad, there's your computer. You know you're getting old when your stuff shows up in the Smithsonian. You can't run today's computer programs on an old 486. It won't work. It's not that the old 486 was bad. It was great in its day. But today you would be asking it to do more than it could possibly do. Maybe, maybe we ask too much of marriage. If you're seeking the largest proportion of your life fulfillment from your spouse, you're asking too much. Because you were created with a craving for eternity. And that craving for eternity will only be fulfilled by a relationship you have with God. Your wife isn't God. Your husband isn't God. Only God can fill that eternal ache in your soul. And when you finally get that, then and only then will you have a new appreciation for this person with whom you have embarked upon this earthly journey. It's amazing to me how often Scripture compares God's relationship with people to marriage. He does it again and again and again. In Isaiah 62 and verse 5, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so God rejoices over you. In Matthew 9 and verse 15, Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to a wedding banquet. In Revelation 19 and verse 7, the wedding of the Lamb, he says, the bride has made herself ready. It's also interesting to me that in the Old Testament, when God talks about the breakdown of spiritual fidelity of Israel... He puts it in terms that we can understand. He talks about the spiritual infidelity of Israel in terms of marital infidelity. In passages like Jeremiah 3 and verse 8, listen to this. I gave Israel her divorce and sent her away because of her adulteries. Perhaps no place is the sacredness of marriage seen with greater clarity than in that fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians. Look there with me. In Ephesians chapter 5, where holy matrimony is compared to the holy union between Christ and his church. Ephesians 5:22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. You know, in this submission thing, you really need to back up one more verse to verse 21. Because Paul presents this in kind of a 1, 2, 3, A, B, C kind of sequence. If you go back to verse 21, he says, Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Is marriage excluded from verse 21? Or would marriage be included in that? Be subject to one another in the fear of or out of respect or out of reverence for Christ. You know, there's some things 
that my wife knows a whole lot more about than I do. And there's plenty of times I submit to her judgment because of that very reason. We are not in competition. We work to complement one another. And that's exactly what he's saying in verse 21. Be in subjection to one another in the fear of Christ. And then he says, verse 22, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. God has an orderly arrangement for everything he has created. From the creation to governments to the church to the home, everything God touches, there's order to it. And here's the order. And he goes on to explain the order in verse 23, A and B and C. For as the husband is the head of Christ, as Christ is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. And he goes on with further explanation. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Verse 28, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. And verse 29, no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and he cherishes it as Christ does the church. How can we read passages like that and not come away with a higher appreciation for the sacredness of marriage? How can we read verses like that and not understand why the holy goes into matrimony, that it's part of what God wants? Go back to 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 5, look at verse 9. Let's look at some verses we don't usually think about in regard to marriage. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 9, he says, Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, and this is what you need to underline in your Bible, to be pleasing to him. Is marriage exempt from that? Or is marriage included in that? The first purpose of marriage beyond sexual expression, beyond the bearing of children, beyond companionship, is not what most people think it is. It's not about my happiness. It's about him. To be pleasing to him. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Is marriage excluded from that? Or is marriage included in that? And staying in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 15. He died for all so that they who live might, here it is again, underline this, no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose on their behalf. Is marriage exempt from that? Or is marriage a part of that? What God is demanding that I do, he's demanding that I look at my relationship through the lens of his perspective. And he is telling me and you that marriage is not about your happiness nor mine. It's not about our glory. It's about him. It's about honoring him. And then come down to verse 18. All these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Notice those terms. The ministry of reconciliation. I think Paul is talking specifically about the great commission that Jesus gave the apostles to go into all of the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let me ask you this. Is not the very work, is not the very work of the church, is not the very core of the gospel, the ministry of reconciliation to share the good news that man can be reconciled to God through Jesus the Son? You say, what does that have to do with marriage? I want you to think. 
When two people can't get along and they get a divorce, what do you think is the number one reason given for that? Have you ever heard the phrase irreconcilable? What? Differences. Irreconcilable. Interesting. What's the point? If our homes are fraught with fighting and animosity and distrust and anger and resentment, do you know what has happened? Our marriage has contradicted our message. And if our marriage contradicts our message, then we have sabotaged the very goal of life itself. Goal to live pleasing to Jesus, verse 9, and to then share the message of reconciliation to other people. Because I tell you, a marriage that is God-honoring puts flesh on the picture of reconciliation. Because a marriage that is God-honoring will model forgiveness and selfless love and sacrifice. What do you think is the basis of reconciliation? If it's not forgiveness and selfless love and sacrifice. What are you saying? I'm saying that what we do as husbands and wives on a regular basis for one another gives us a little bitty taste of what God does for us on a regular basis. Forgiveness, selfless love, and sacrifice. Your marriage will either be a stumbling block or a stepping stone to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Abuses in marriage, I think, is a hidden secret in a lot of churches. And if you don't think that happens, think again. Physical abuse, emotional abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse with pornography, financial abuse, spiritual abuse, where people take passages either out of context or spotlighting some and completely ignoring others. When Julie went back to school and got her master's degree in marriage and family therapy, she was told by a therapist who is a Christian you're going to be busier than you ever dreamed you would be. And he was right. It is an epidemic where husbands and wives don't treat each other out of reverence for God. So she came to me recently with this idea. She said, I want, to have a, I want to have a conference where we invite some of these women who are recovering from terrible abusive relationships, both past and present. And I want to have a, I want to, I want to have a conference where we can help these women. And I said, okay, just invite them to the house. She said, you don't understand. Our house isn't that big. She said, we need a place. She said, how big are the cabins in Gatlinburg? I said, there's cabins in Gatlinburg that will sleep 50. We can't afford that. So we compromised. We rented a cabin in Gatlinburg in the Great Smoky Mountains that could take care of 30. 
I said, honey, if nobody shows up, you and I are going to be in a really big house for the weekend. And we put the word out. And within two weeks, it was sold out. But some of the women were in financial situations where they could not attend. And it's amazing how God works. We began to get phone calls from Christians all across the country saying, this is a need. My daughter, my granddaughter, this person in our congregation, I want to sponsor someone to come. And then to be able to make phone calls to some of these women and tell them your trip, your accommodations, everything has been paid, gifted by a Christian who cares. I don't think it's going to be the last. We call it Thrive. Teaching the truth of Scripture, healing toward wellness, renewal of self in God's image, imitating the compassion of Jesus, victory in prayer, and expectations for a better you. Thrive. I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, shepherds, we can't keep sweeping this under the pew. And I, for one, am not afraid to talk about it. And neither is she. In fact, as soon as Thrive is over, she's coming back to Houston to spend a weekend at another congregation, Decker Prairie, to talk to the ladies there about a lot of these things at the invitation of the elders there. Your marriage will either be a stumbling block or a stepping stone to the gospel. We live in a society where relationships are just discarded with frightening regularity. Whereas Christians who work very, very hard to maintain a God-glorifying relationship command great attention. Because our lives and our relationships and our marriages are platforms of evangelism to either lead others to Jesus or to push them away. And sometimes they are members of our own families. Because somebody in the family wasn't giving reverence to God by their behavior and by their attitude. How many of you have been married 30 years? At least 30 years. Even those of you who have lost spouses, count. How many of you were married 30 years? Any of 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. Oh, his hand went down. I was doing this one place, and, I, and, and this, this brother sitting right back in the back where he is, he kept raising his hand. 70, 80. 90, 100, he raised his hand. And I said, brother, you've been married 100 years? He said, no, but it sure feels like it. <laughs> I hate to be in that car on the way home. <laughs> you know, it's easy for younger people going through stuff, it's easy for them to look at folks who've been married 30, 40, 50, 60 years and to think, well, they had it easier than I have, than we have. And that's not so. Everybody that raised their hand bears testimony to God's love and God's forgiveness and God's sacrifice, which, ladies and gentlemen, is the, basic, is the basis of reconciliation, which is the basis of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me leave you with one more thing. Your spouse is not just your spouse. Your spouse is God's daughter. Your spouse is God's son. And we understand that if we want to get on the good side of parents, 
we know to be good to their kids. But we also know that if you want to make a parent very, very angry, then you start picking on that child. You be mean, you be a bully. And you fire up parental indignation in a hurry. It's the same with God. Zechariah 2 and verse 8 says, If anybody touches you, they touch the apple of my eye. You married God's child. So it's not, about, it's not just about me and this other person over here. It's about me and a daughter of God. We talk about the fatherhood of God. Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father who is in heaven. Extend the analogy. Guys, if, the, if, if God is the father of the woman you married, do you understand what that makes him to you? He's your father-in-law. And if you fail to respect your wife and you demean her, and you mistreat her, and you speak condescendingly to her, you're going to court trouble with your father-in-law. 1 Peter 3, verse 7, Show her honor as a, as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers, husband, so that your prayers might not be hindered. As a father... I would pray that my kids all marry spouses that would love them as much as I love them. And yet I know, because I've spent time with them, I know that every child falls short of perfection. Every child has quirks. Every child has limitations because their daddy does. So my prayer is that they would have a spouse who would be very kind to them, very forgiving of them. Very patient with them. I would hate to think they would marry someone who would be cruel to them, who would be abusive to them. So here it is. God is fully aware that your spouse has limitations. God is fully aware that your spouse has quirks. God is fully aware that your spouse isn't perfect, that your spouse has sins, that your spouse has a past. God is fully aware of all of that. He wants you and me to be as forgiving of their faults as we would want our kids' spouses to be with them. So think about how you treated your spouse lately. Is that how you want your daughter treated? Is that how you want your son treated by their spouse? You didn't just marry any man or woman. You married a child of God. And God watches every day how you treat his special child. I don't remember the occasion. But Julie sent Luke and I out for the day. He was about 17 then. She sends us out for the day to go play golf and have a big time. And she said, when you guys get back, I'm going to have supper ready for you. I'm going to really do this upright. And so we went out. We had a blast, father and son. We had a great time. We come back home, and she had this fabulous spread. She is a great cook. And we ate, and we ate, and then we cleared the table, and she said, I have fixed you guys a chocolate pie. And I looked over there on the counter, and there it was. It looked fake, all that meringue. I mean, it's just perfect. And so I thought, man. So she cuts a piece of chocolate pie, and she puts it in front of me. Now, my wife is a stickler for manners. She taught all the kids, when you're at somebody's house or when you're at our house and the hostess is serving dessert, don't just start digging in. Wait until either the hostess says, go ahead and start, 
or the hostess has it in front of her and she sits down and then you can start. So that's been drilled into us over and over and over again. So she sits this piece of chocolate pie in front of me and I'm just sitting there waiting and waiting. And I took the tip of my fork and I stuck it in a little bit of that chocolate and I took a bite, just a lick, didn't count. And I got to tell you something. It was the most horrible thing I've ever eaten in my life. It was bad. And I realized as soon as I took a bite of it, she didn't add any sugar to this thing. It was bitter. And I started to say something. And then I realized I've got a 17-year-old boy sitting here. And when he digs in, he's going to dig in. No, this is going to be too good. So I waited. She said, oh, go ahead, eat, eat, eat. And I watched that 17-year-old boy. He dug in with his fork. He got a big bite of that stuff, stuck it in his mouth. And I watched as those cheeks got bigger and bigger and bigger and tears began to stream down his face and he spit chocolate pie all over and she was mortified. What in the world is going on? She took a bite. She said, oh, no. She knew what she had done. And so she's gathering up the plates. And I said, no, 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 wait, wait. She said, you're not going to eat this. I said, just hold it, just wait. And I looked at Luke and I said, do what I do. We scraped off that beautiful meringue. And I am here in Houston, Texas to tell you people my wife makes the best meringue pie ever. And the point is, every day in marriage is not going to be sweet. There's going to be days of hardship and there's going to be days of hard times and bitterness at, at, at times, just the difficulty of life. There's going to be things happen in your life that's going to knock you down to numb. What are you going to do then? You made a vow. And you're going to do what, John? You're going to eat the meringue. And you're going to love it. <laughs> Marriage isn't easy. But it is easy for us at times to think when we talk about the gospel is for all. As Bubba said a while ago, to always think about way out there. And sometimes we miss the ones seated at our own table under our own roof. May God help us to live a life of godliness as a husband and godliness as a wife and to fulfill what Paul said you do it all out of reverence for God. Amen? We're done. Thank you all very much.